Hello everyone, I hope all of you are doing good and this is Roshni from LearnoHub, the free learning platform, learnohub.com. So welcome to the seventh video and the last video of the video series on Tissues Class 9 Science. Now in this video, we are going to spend a bit of time talking about aerolar tissue, tendons and ligaments. After that, we will discuss about muscular tissue and nervous tissue and they again are very, very important for you. So, are you ready to learn with me? Let's get started. We'll move on to the next connective tissue that is ligament. So the ligament is a dense connective tissue. What is a dense connective tissue? As I mentioned before, a connective tissue which has more of fibers in their um, extracellular matrix. So they are known as fibrous connective tissue or dense connective tissue. So the, now, so ligament, what is a ligament? So ligament is a tissue which connects two bones. Now since it connects two bones, that is why it is a connective tissue. So if you look at this picture, you have two bones here. This is one bone, this is another bone, right? As I mentioned before, the cap of the bone is cartilage. So this is this this cartilage. So what is ligament? Something which will join these two bones. So if you see here, this portion it is actually joining these two bones right so this is cartilage so anything which joins two bones is a uh, is a i'm sorry it is a ligament so ligament is a fibrous connective tissue it has more of fibers it contains collagen fibers and elastin protein so this is what it is mostly made up of collagen fibers and elastin protein I, we talked about However, in brief, but we talked something about collagen fibers. It is one of the fibers which are uh, secreted by the connective tissue. It is the most abundant fiber as well. Right. And this is the fiber which is responsible for the flexibility of the connective tissue. It is considerably strong. I mean, it is not very weak. It is considerably strong, but at the same time, it is not very strong. You would have often heard people uh, come across uh, with these kind of problems like their ligament is teared or their ligament have broken off, right? Because, because of some kind of uh, not only accidents, because of some minor things also, minor accidents can also cause damage to the ligaments because ligament is not very strong. It is an elastic tissue. It has elasticity. So it can bear some kind of um, twisting and curving without breaking itself because of the presence of this protein elastin it has this elastic properties little extracellular matrix so in this when you look at the structure of a ligament it has got very less extracellular matrix it has more of fib fibers as i mentioned dense connective tissue while I was talking about the structure of connective tissue, I already told you, right, that what will, what will be the quantity of extracellular matrix, how much will be the fibers, how much would be the ground substance. So it all changes with different kind of tissues. Now, since it changes, therefore, the structure of the tissue changes and therefore the property of that particular connective tissue also changes. So now in case of ligament, they have got very little extracellular matrix. They have more of fibers and that is why they are also called as dense connective tissue right but since in fibers also it has collagen fibers and elastin protein so these two together gives it some flexibility and elasticity so even though it is dense but it has got elasticity because of the presence of these fibers so let us now look at the next connect dense connective tissue that is tendons the tendons and ligaments, people often confuse between ligaments and tendons. So as I said, ligaments are those which connects bones to bones. When I talk of tendons, it connects bones to muscles. See, in our body, everything has to be interconnected, right? If you connect only the bones and if you don't connect the bones to the muscles, what will happen? There will be nothing to keep the muscles intact, right? So everything has to be connected with each other. Correct? So now we have connected bone to bone with the help of this ligament. Now this bone has to be connected to the muscles also. So that is done by tendon. So it is actually connecting the bone to the muscles. So it is again a fibrous connective tissue. It contains mostly collagen fibers. So now this does not have elastin protein. It has good strength. 
limited flexibility so now you can understand from where did the flexibility come because the uh, ligaments had both elastin protein and collagen fibers so due to the presence of the elastin protein it has little more elasticity so it had little more flexibility so because of the presence of elastin protein it uh, uh, ligaments had more flexibility but where, when compared to the tendons now however tendons are made up of collagen fibers so it is not that it does not have flexibility at all because collagen fibers also give some flexibility to the tissue so it has flexibility but to a limited extent so now we will look at the next type of connective tissue that is aerolar connective tissue so let us see what is aerolar connective tissue it is a loose connective tissue what do i mean by loose connective tissue i mean see these are all simple terms and you can guess what it means like dense connective tissue meant that it has little of um, extracellular matrix so more of cells more of fibers so that is why it was fibrous connective tissue loose connective tissue means it has the cells are widely dispersed in extracellular matrix that means the cells are far apart from each other and there is a lot of extracellular matrix that you can see so that is a loose connective tissue <clears throat> now what are the characteristics of a loose connective tissue it has loosely organized fibers the fibers are not also very congested or they are also not too much so they are also loosely organized abundant blood vessels there are too many blood vessels present within these kind of tissues enough empty space which makes it Call, be called as loose connective tissue because you have so much of empty space. Now, what is the purpose of this tissue? Why do we actually have aerolar tissue? It binds skin to muscles. As I said, everything has to be binded to one another. When you have bones, if, you, if we say that bones form the skeleton of our body, so bones need to be connected to other bones. For example, our feet needs to be connected to the knee, knee has to be connected to our uh, body and then again the shoulder has to be connected to the hand. So everything needs to be connected. So all the bones have to be connected. So bones to bones connection was done by ligaments again bones has to be connected to the muscles because the muscles are the ones which actually help us in movement in moving our body because this connective tissue the purpose of connective tissue is to connect every part of our body so bone to bone got connected now bone to muscle connection is needed for movement because muscles actually help us in movement so bone to muscles was done by tendons that's also fair. So now the bones and the muscles are all connected. Now we have something called skin at the top of everything. So we, you have to connect it to skin as well. So skin to muscles were connected by this aerolar tissue. So it fills space inside organs and holds them in place. So basically it fills up, the aerolar tissue fills up the entire empty space between the skin and the muscles. Like inside our skin, we immediately don't have muscles, there is some space, right? So that space is filled by aerolar tissue. So it also sometimes helps in repair of tissues, okay? It also helps in repairing tissues. Now this aerolar tissue is strong enough to bind tissues yet it is soft enough to provide flexibility and cushioning why is it so because it is soft because of lot of because they are loosely connected so since there is lot of empty space there is lot of extracellular matrix therefore it has lot of flexibility so there is one advantage of this flexibility that it can give a cushioning effect to the organs present inside our body and just as i mentioned in one of the previous cases i took that example right if you want to carry a glass object what do you do you wrap it in uh, something you wrap it in a towel or you wrap it in some cushion like structure or you wrap it in a thermocoil box so that it gets some cushioning effect and does not break so similarly aerolar tissue has a lot of flexibility so it can act as a cushion for some other organs and it is most widely found in vertebrates this tissue is most commonly found in vertebrates now this tissue is there is one unique thing about this tissue that is because of the presence of lot of empty spaces it, it has got huge flexibility but at the same time this tissue has lot of strength so this tissue is strong enough to hold the organs in their places for example in our body inside the skin we have aerolar tissue everywhere so now this tissue will actually help to keep the organs in place. It will keep the heart in its own place. It will keep the lungs in its own place. It, it will not allow things to move 
from here to there right so it is at one end it is a very strong tissue at the other end it is a very flexible tissue so sometimes the appearance of this tissue is also um, very diverse sometimes the appearance of this tissue looks very similar to dense connective tissue sometimes not always because the appearance of areolar tissue is not similar always sometimes at some places they have lot of fibers and they look like dense connective tissue however they are areolar tissue right so i hope you are clear with what is areolar tissue it is something like something which fills up everything between skin and muscles something like that so since it fills up everything it acts as a cushion also it binds the skin to muscles and at the same time it sometimes help in repair of damaged tissues so where do we actually found it it is found in the space between skin and muscles it surrounds blood vessels and nerves it is also found in the bone marrow so these are some of the places where we can find areolar tissue so let us have a quick look at the structure of areolar tissue so when i talk of the structure i'll again talk of the extracellular matrix so in this case the extracellular matrix is fluidic in nature so it is a fluid matrix which is made up of proteins and what are the cells embedded in the matrix many different types of cells are actually present widely dispersed ones are fibroblasts so fibroblast is one of those many types of cells which are present but this is most widely found so the mostly most abundant of all different types of cells is fibroblasts so it looks somewhat like this if you look at this picture this is the matrix the dotted structure shows the matrix which is a fluid matrix made up of proteins now inside that it will have the cells so these are the cells with nucleus so these cells there are many different types of cells under the <laughs> fibroblast we are not going getting into the detail of those types of cells but the most abundant ones are the fibroblasts other than that it also has fibers as i know, as we know that the extracellular matrix will have something called fibers and something called ground substance so it has mostly collagen fibers and elastic fibers so due to the presence of the collagen and elastic again it has got the properties of flexibility now the cells are connect generally connected by ground substance made of collagen and elastic fibers so the how the cells communicate with each other as i said in case of bones they were communicating using the special tunnels called canaliculi because in that case the extracellular matrix was very dense but in this case the extracellular matrix is good enough which has ground substance which has got some fibers also so they actually help in communication between the cells let us now go ahead with the last type of connective tissue which we are going to discuss now that is adipose tissue so it is a connective tissue which mainly acts as fat storage site okay so so far we saw that we talked about almost everything which can form the skeleton of our body and we have also filled the spaces between the skin and muscles with areolar tissue now there is one thing which is still missing and that is the storage of fat now you would have seen that there are many people who are healthy enough who are obese so where do their fats get stored when people start eating a lot they don't do exercise and they keep sleeping and eating and do not work what happens they start gaining weight now as they put on weight what do you think what happens with them we start we start calling them as fat right why because fats are getting accumulated inside their body but that means there are some areas where the fats are getting stored so this kind of tissue actually helps in storage of fat so that is the main purpose of adipose tissue so where do we found this find this adipose tissue it is found in bone marrow it is also found in the breast tissue it is also found below skin so below skin is the area where people actually start accumulating fat breast tissue is something where by default people have lot of fat again bone marrow is also a place where this tissue is found right now the purpose of this tissue is it provides insulation from heat and cold now what happens when lot of fat gets accumulated inside your body what will happen 
it gives you insulation. You would have seen that if there is a person who is very fat and there is another person who is very lean and thin, if both of them go out in a, in a summer day, right? So what will happen? The person who is fat, he feels little more hot as compared to the thin person. Similarly, if they go out to a cold climate, if the lean and thin person needs two sweaters, the fat person would need only one sweater. That's because the fats which are being accumulated in his body, that fat provides him insulation. So it pro protects him from heat and cold. So that is one purpose of the adipose tissue. It provides protective padding to organs. So now again, the same thing when you have so much of fats accumulated in a tissue, so it actually acts as a cushion. So, it, so when, whenever it acts as a cushion, it becomes like a protective covering to many organs. It reserves lipids which can be utilized as energy when needed. Similarly, like for example, you would have seen that there are so many energy drinks available in the market. Not only energy drinks, you would have also heard your mom saying that drink a glass of milk, then you'll get energy so that uh, you can study hard and you can do well in your exams. Why do, does she say so? Because they think that milk has lots of nutrients which will actually give you energy. So when you drink milk or when you take any other um, substance which has got energy, so these adipose tissue helps in reserving the lipids which can be later utilized as energy when needed. For example, right now you have taken some nutrients and you want to um, do some, some work after one hour. So when you need that energy, that energy can be utilized. So this adipose tissue basically act as a storage for fats and lipids and besides that it acts as insulation from heat and cold and as protective padding to various organs. So when you look at an adipose tissue, it looks somewhat like this as, uh, as has been shown in this picture where you have big globules of fat. So we will talk about the structure of adipose tissue in the next slide. So let us now look at the structure of adipose tissue. Now in adipose tissue the extracellular matrix is not seen as such. And what are the cells embedded in the matrix? Many types of cells are present but out of them the most abundant ones are known as adipocytes. So the cells of adipose tissue are known as adipocytes. <clears throat> cells are filled with fat globules in the form of triglycerides. So if you see, this is a cell, right? And inside the cell, if you see, you have got a big fat droplet. So the fats are stored in the form of triglycerides inside this cells. So if you look at the structure of adipose tissue, so if you look at the structure of the adipose tissue here, you can see that the entire thing is filled with the fat globules. They, are, they have big fat globules which contains fats in the form of triglycerides, right? Now when does a person become obese? When do we say that a person is suffering from obesity? Obesity means excessive weight. When the number of adipocytes increases than the required number. So there is a desired number of adipocytes which should be present in a person depending upon his age and sex, right? Now when that number of adipocytes increases, that means the number, each adipocyte has got fat droplet right so the number of adipocytes increasing means the fat droplets increasing that means the amount of fat in the body is also increasing so when the number of adipocytes increases than the desired number we say that the person is suffering from obesity this will end our discussion on connective tissue and i i hope that the video helped you in understanding the different types of connective tissue and their structure so now we will go ahead with muscular tissue so what is muscular tissue so connective tissue connected the different parts of the body, epithelial tissue act as a covering of everything present inside the body and what is muscular tissue? It is responsible for movements in the body. So the tissue which is responsible for movements in the body is muscular tissue. As the name suggests, muscular is derived from the word muscles. So that means muscles are something which actually helps us in moving, right? So here we are going to talk about muscular tissue. So you would have seen this for an example. When we breathe, what happens? The chest muscles 
move. There is some movement which keeps happening in our chest. If you want, you can try it yourself. Breathe in and breathe out and just keep your hand over your chest. And you can feel that there is some kind of movement as it is as shown on in this picture. There is a similar kind of movement happening in your body. And that movement happens because of the muscles which is present around the chest. So that it is because of the, uh, the expansion and contraction of the chest muscles. So not only the breathing process whatever we do for example while cooking what are we doing we are moving our hands right so how are we able to move our hands it is because of the muscles which are present in our hands that we are able to move it similarly while playing or when we are running our heart beats so all these movements are because of some muscles associated with them for example the movement of the heart is also because of the heart muscles the muscles which are present on the walls of the heart so because of the contraction and expansion of those muscles the movement happens so may any kind of movement which you can think of whether we move our hands or uh, the heart beats or the breathing process so everything in which involves movement also involves muscular tissue now let us see how actually the muscular tissues cause movement now, this muscular tissues contain muscle fibers. So, as we all know, one of the constituent of all tissues is fibers. So, even inside this muscular tissue, we have muscle fibers. And these muscle fibers contain a special kind of proteins known as contractile proteins. Now, these contractile proteins enables contraction and relaxation. So, uh, do you understand by what do I mean by contraction and relaxation? For example, if you have a spring, when you stretch the spring, it can get stretched like this. When you compress it, it can get compressed like this, right? So that means when it expands, we say it is expanding or it is relaxing. So this situation is known as relaxation and this situation is known as contraction, right? So these muscle fibers have a special type of protein which are known as contractile proteins. The name of the protein itself is derived from this property of contraction of these proteins. So due to the presence of these proteins, the muscle fibers can also contract and relax. They can also expand and contract. And this contraction and relaxation of the muscle fibers actually cause movement. Because when, when, it, when we studied about connective tissue, even the connective tissues were made up of different type of fibers like the collagen fibers the, which provided strength, the elastin fibers which provided elasticity, the reticular fibers which again provided a support to the connective tissue. But there were none of the, and they were all made up of uh, either proteins or uh, sugars or something like that. But in case of this muscle fibers, they are made up of this special kind of protein, contractile protein, because of which they can contract and relax. And this contraction and relaxation of the muscle fibers causes the movement, causes the movement of the muscles. Right, so whatever muscles we have, if we feel like raising our hand, we are able to raise our hand because the muscle fibers which are present inside our body, they are actually contracting and expanding and because of that movement, we are able to move our hand. So this is the basic property. I mean, this is the basic cause, the contractile protein behind the movements in our body. So now let us look at the different types of muscular tissues. Now, there are basically three types of muscular tissues, skeletal muscles, smooth muscles and cardiac muscles. So we will talk about each of these muscles one by one now that what are skeletal muscles, what are smooth muscles and what are cardiac muscles. So let us talk about the skeletal muscle tissue. So this is the most abundant tissue in vertebrates. So most commonly found is the skeletal muscle tissue. As the name suggests, skeletal, that means this muscle tissue has something to do with the skeleton. So let us see what it is. It causes movement of bones of skeletal system. So that is why it is known as skeletal muscle tissue because it causes the movement of bones. In connective tissue, that means it... The connective tissues connect the body and forms the skeletal system and the muscle tissue helps to move the bones of the skeleton. 
so these are also known as voluntary muscles why are they called voluntary muscles because these kind of muscles these kind of movements which we are talking about that happens as per our will if we want to move our hand we move our hand if we want to stop the movement we can stop it so that means the movement happens as per our will and that is why these kind of muscles are known as voluntary muscles now for example you can consider the movement of your hands you can consider uh, the example when you are jogging if you feel like jogging you will jog right so that means you will make the movements only when you want and you will stop making the movements when you don't want so that is why they are called voluntary muscles they are also termed as striated muscles why are they called striated muscles that's because when these muscles these muscle tissue were observed under microscope alternate dark and bright bands were seen that means some bands like this were seen one dark one light one dark one light so these kind of bands were seen when this tissue was observed under microscope so because of the presence of this stripes or these striations these muscles are known as striated muscles and this alternate dark and light bands are called striations so that is why they are striated muscles so a skeletal muscle tissue can be called as a voluntary muscle tissue or a striated muscle tissue so when you think of your skeletal uh, muscle tissue you can think of these examples when you play because it happens as per your will or when you jog right now let us look at the structure of a skeletal muscle tissue how does it look like now in the skeletal muscle tissue also contains muscle fibers and the muscle fibers in this case are generally long and cylindrical these are multi nucleated cells that means each cell has multiple nucleus they are called multi nucleated multi means many nucleated means nucleus so a cell with multiple nucleus is called multi nucleated so muscle fibers i mean the cells making up the skeletal muscle tissue they have many nucleus they are generally long and cylindrical multiple mitochondria to meet the energy needs it also has many mitochondria now why do you think that you have multiple mitochondria in skeletal muscle tissue because skeletal muscle tissue is something which actually helps in the movement of our skeleton now in order to make movements we need need lot of energy and where does this energy come from it comes from the cell and who prepares and or who generates energy inside a cell who is the power house of a cell mitochondria right so when you have more mitochondria you can generate more energy so you can use that energy in for different types of movements for example you would have seen that if you are doing uh, some exercise or if you are dancing or if you are jogging you need more energy to do these things because it it involves continuous movements right and for these movements you want your muscle tissues to show relaxation and contraction so for that again energy is needed so that energy comes from the mitochondria so that is why the skeletal muscle tissue cells have multiple nucleus and they also have mitochondria to meet energy needs now when you look at them the structure looks somewhat like this so you can see the striations right one light band one dark band one light band one dark band that is why they are known as striated muscles so these are the striations one dark one light here you can see but the multiple nucleus which are present now this is just one muscle fiber so one muscle fiber is long and cylindrical as you can see it it has multi nucleated cells it has so many nuclei in one cell right so this is how a skeletal muscle tissue will look like now in biology there is another important thing is that you should always have the picture of everything in your mind for example whenever you think of skeletal muscle tissue you should have this picture in your mind because many times you are asked to draw diagrams of different parts of our body now what is the function of the skeletal muscle tissue it helps in the coordinated movement of limbs jaws eyeballs etc so all kinds of movements it is also involved in the breathing process because while breathing also you would have seen that the things are in your control let us suppose i want to breathe i am going to take a long breath now so i can take a long breath so it it is as per my will so it has some role to play even in the in uh, breathing process because that happens voluntarily right so with this we will start with the next type of muscle tissue that is the smooth muscle tissue
it controls the involuntary movements of the body system so in skeletal muscle tissue we we included all the voluntary movements that means all movements that happen as per our will so in smooth muscle tissue we'll talk about movements that happen involuntarily whether we want it or we don't want it the movements keep taking place so that is why these muscles are called involuntary muscles they are also known as unstriated muscles because when these type of muscle tissue are observed under a microscope, the alternate dark and bright bands or the striations were not at all seen. So they are, they are known as unstriated muscles. So some of the examples of a um, smooth muscle tissue can be like, for example, our digestive system. So the food which we take in, the movement of the food takes place through the alimentary canal and it reaches the digestive system. So there it passes through the intestines, the stomach and all. So nobody, we don't want it to, even if I say that, okay, I don't, today I don't want the food to reach the digestive system. So do, do you think that the food will not reach? It will still reach. So that means the movement will still happen and those movements happen because of these smooth muscle tissues which are present somewhere around the digestive tract. So these kind of movements which are not under our control, are known as involuntary movements. So let us look at the structure of a smooth muscle tissue. How does it differ from a skeletal muscle tissue? So here the cells are spindle shaped. What is spindle shaped? Spindle means it will be elongated, but both the ends will be thin and pointed. So it will look somewhat like this. So here you can see a spindle shaped cell. So this is a cell which is in the shape of a spindle. That means it is long, it is thin, it is elongated, but the ends are pointed. So they are known as spindle shaped cells. They are uninucleated because you see each cell has one nucleus. See, this is one cell, so this has one nucleus, right? So these are two important points of difference between the structure of a skeletal muscle tissue and smooth muscle tissue. In skeletal muscle tissue, you have multiple nuclei per cell. Here you have one nuclei per cell. In the skeletal muscle tissue, the cells are elongated and cylindrical in shape and here they are thin elongated with pointed ends, that is spindle shaped. Now let us look at the function of smooth muscle tissue. It helps in the movement of food along the digestive tract, say alimentary canal, stomach and intestine. It also helps in the contraction and relaxation of the blood vessels. So the blood vessels, I mean, when, when the heart pumps blood, so the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood keeps moving throughout our body with the help of the blood vessels. So this movement also happens because of the contraction and relaxation of the blood vessels. So this movement is also involuntary. We cannot stop the movement of blood throughout the body, right? So these are some of the examples of smooth muscle tissue, that is involuntary muscles. So with this, we will start with the cardiac muscles. Cardiac, the, what is the term cardiac? Cardiac is something related to heart. So you would have always heard of the cardiology department in hospitals. That means the department which deals with the diseases related to heart. Similarly, you would have heard of a cardiologist. That means a doctor who is a heart specialist. So the cardiac muscles are the heart muscles. So this, our heart keeps beating, right, all the time. So as long as we are alive, heart will keep beating. So this beating of the heart is also involuntary. But these muscles have little different characteristics than the uh, smooth muscles. And that is why they have been classified separately as cardiac muscles. Because you might think that the beating of the heart is also involuntary. So we could have put this heart muscles also along with the uh, involuntary muscles or with the smooth muscles but since there are certain differences or there are certain different properties which these muscles show, show that is why they have been classified as a separate group. So these are unique muscles found only in the walls of the heart. So these kind of muscles are found only in the walls of heart and that is why they are known as cardiac muscles. They are responsible for rhythmic contraction and relaxation of heart throughout life. So the heart keeps beating throughout life. So the contraction, why, why does the heart move? It is because of the relaxation and contraction of the heart muscles. And this keeps happening at periodic intervals of time throughout life. 
So let us look at the structure of the cardiac muscles. Then we will come to know why are these muscles unique, why they don't fall under the category of striated or unstriated muscles. Now these muscles have few similarities with skeletal muscles whereas few other similarities with smooth muscles and that is why we cannot group them under any of these. So these were the only muscles other than the heart muscles the muscles which other all the muscles which are present inside our body they have similarities either with skeletal muscle or smooth muscle so they have been grouped under each category but heart muscles were the only unique ones which had some properties of skeletal muscles and some properties of smooth muscles so that is why we have made them as a separate group called cardiac muscles it has striations however not so prominent so this is the similarity with skeletal muscles the skeletal muscles had striations that is alternate dark and light bands right so here you can see the alternate dark and light bands which are termed as striations so they have striations but the striations are not as prominent as the skeletal muscles but at the same time it is uninucleate now striated muscles are multinucleate right so it is uninucleate so this is a similarity with smooth muscles Again, these are involuntary muscles. So this is again a similarity with smooth muscles. So that means the cardiac muscles have characteristics which are a combination of the characteristics of skeletal muscles and smooth muscles. So here you can see it is uninucleate. So for every cell you have one nucleus. Now let us have a quick comparison between the three types of muscles which we have discussed just now. Skeletal versus smooth versus cardiac muscles. Now the skeletal muscles are striated, smooth muscles are non-striated, cardiac muscles are striated but not so prominent. Skeletal muscles are voluntary, cardiac smooth muscles are involuntary, cardiac muscles are also involuntary. Skeletal muscles, when I talk about the structure of the cell, they have long cylindrical cells, the smooth muscles have spindle-shaped cells and the cardiac muscles have cylindrical branched cells. So you can see here they have got cylindrical cells but they are branched. See, from one cell is connected to another cell, with, I mean, it is like a branching pattern. Skeletal muscles are multinucleate, you have multiple nucleus, nuclei on one cell. Smooth muscles are uninucleate, that is one nucleus per cell. And cardiac muscles are also uninucleate. So these, this was a comparison between the three types of muscle tissue. So I think with this, we have ended our discussion on muscular tissue. So the next topic which we are going to discuss is the last type of connective is the last type of animal tissue which is going to be nervous tissue. So let us see what are we going to study about in nervous tissue. So what is nervous tissue actually? It is the main component which constitutes the nervous system. So what is the nervous system? So when I talk of the nervous system, I am actually talking about brain, spinal cord and the peripheral nerves which we have in our body. So from there, from the term nerve, it gets this name nervous. So what does the nervous system actually do? Have you ever experienced such scenario that when you touch a hot object, you immediately remove your hand? Why do you take your hand back? What makes you feel that you have touched something which is hot? What helps you to distinguish between hot and cold? Now at the moment you touch the hot bucket of water, a signal goes to your brain and the brain interprets the signal and tells you that this water is hot and that is why you remove your hand. Now this entire thing, this transmission of signal happens so fast that it happens within almost instantaneously and we feel that the moment we touch the water, we, it, we removed it instantly. But actually the signal goes to the brain and the brain tells you that this is hot, right? So, so whenever I am talking about nervous system, I am basically talking about three main components that is brain, spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. What are peripheral nerves? That means the nerves which are present throughout our body. Now when you look at it, you will see that there are so many nerves which are present in the body. Here if you see this is our brain, this is the spinal cord and from the spinal cord itself you have so many nerves coming out. 
I mean, you can just see how many nerves are there. I, I don't want to discuss about each of them right now. That will become too complicated. But I'm just trying to tell you there are so many nerves which are actually present inside our body. So because of the presence of nerves everywhere in all parts of our body, what happens? Let us suppose if you, uh, if while walking, if you step on something which is sharp, right? What happens? You get hurt. What makes you feel that you got hurt when you touched that pointed object? As soon as you touch as soon as you touch that object, the, the nerves here actually will transmit that signal to the brain. The brain will then tell you that you have point, you have stepped on a sharp object and then you remove your step back. So things happen very fast. So now you understand what, what is nervous system. So now this nervous system consists of brain, the nerves and the spinal cord and all of these are made up of a tissue. So that tissue is known as the nervous tissue. So here we are going to talk about the nervous tissue. <clears throat> now what is the speciality of the nervous tissue? I mean this kind of behavior was not shown by any other tissue. For example, the muscular tissue helped in movement. So what was the speciality of the muscular tissue? It contained a special type of protein called contractile protein because of which it had thus capability to cause movement. Similarly, the nervous tissue is able to react to situations so fast. So what is it or what is the speciality that a nervous tissue has? So let us talk about that. The cells of the nervous tissue are highly specialized to respond to stimuli and then transmitting the stimulus very rapidly from one place to another within the body. So what is stimulus? This is again a new term, <clears throat> right? So let us first understand stimulus. It is an event that evokes a specific functional reaction in an organ or tissue. That means any such incident which makes you react to it. For example, when I, as I took the example of the hot water, so that hot water was present when you touched the hot water you immediately reacted so that means there was a specific reaction and the reaction is also similar now as soon as you touch the hot water what is going to be the reaction you will take your hand back right so that is a specific reaction similarly let us suppose if you if you touch something which is extremely cold it is freezing if you touch something, there also you immediately tend to move your hand back, right? Similarly, when you get an electric shock, what is the expected reaction? The specific reaction is that again you will jerk back, right? So the such events, the events which is taking place, which is making you to react in a specific manner, those events are known as stimulus. So in this case, the hot water bath was creating a was the stimulus. Similarly, the uh, electric board which was giving you shock that is a stimulus because that is causing you to react in a specific way. So that is stimulus. Now as such the cells which are all the cells inside our body they respond to stimulus. So in case of any such event all cells will react. But the cells of nervous tissue are highly specialized so that they respond to stimuli very fast and then they transmit that stimulus very rapidly from one place to another. For example, if you touch something, as I mentioned, if you touch something very hot with your hand, your hand will react to it. So the cells which are present inside your hand, they will react to it. But at the same time, the cells of the nervous tissue will immediately transmit that stimulus from your hand to the brain. And then the brain will tell you what to do next. Right? So that means it is not only responding to the stimulus, but it is also transmitting the stimulus very rapidly from one place to another. And because of this basic nature of the nervous tissue, we have the entire nervous system functioning. So you can just imagine what would happen if the nervous system doesn't function properly. Right? The, the person we, we call a person as, we, we generally use the term mad. He is a mad guy, he is a, she is a mad girl. That means he is not able to think properly, he is not able to take proper decisions, right? So then we say that the person is insane, right? So the nervous system plays a very important role in our life and the nervous system is made up of nervous tissue. So the nervous tissue is also something very important which you should know. So some of the examples which will explain you stimulus is when you touch a cup of hot coffee, what happens? The instant specific reaction is that you will take your hand back. Similarly, let us suppose you are walking down the street and suddenly you meet your teacher and you say, hey, hi, 
So what makes you greet your teacher? Because as soon as you see, your eye is the organ which is just seeing things. The eye will just see it, but immediately the signal will reach from eye to your brain and the brain will tell you that she, the person whom you are seeing is your teacher. So the moment you say, oh, she is my teacher. So what happens? The signal again goes to your tongue and then you say that, hey, hi. So then you know that you have to greet this person. Right? So what was the stimulus here? The event that you saw your teacher. That was the event. So that was the stimulus. And what was the reaction? The reaction was your greet. You said, hey, hi. So that was the reaction. Similarly, when you get your results, you become very happy. Right? Similarly, when you do not score well in your exams, you become so sad. So these are some of the reactions which happen under different situations. So such situations which causes a specific reaction in an organ or a tissue is known as stimulus and this nervous the cells of this nervous tissue are highly specialized to react to these kind of stimuli and that is how the that is the basic fact based on which the entire nervous system functions now let us see what constitutes the nervous tissue what is the nervous tissue made up of the cells of the nervous tissue are known as nerve cells or neurons like for example, every cell has a different name. For bone cell, we had osteocyte. For cartilage cells, we had chondrocytes. Similarly, for nerve cells, we call them as neurons. Now, how does a neuron look like? So let us look, have a look at the structure of a neuron. So we can say that the neuron's cell body consists of, so this is the cell body of a neuron. So it has an axon. So this is the axon, this part is known as axon. This is how a neuron actually looks like. So let us try to understand the structure of a neuron in this slide. So what all do you have? A cell body. Inside the cell body, what all do you have? You have a nucleus. So this is the nucleus. This is your cell body, right? This is the cell body. Like every other cell, this also has a nucleus. This also has a cytoplasm. That is the fluid-like structure which is filling the space. The cytoplasm and many other cell organelles which are not shown in this picture but all other normal cell organelles are also present inside this cell body but it has some different things also what are the different things the special things which it has as dendrites what are dendrites dendrites are short thin hair like structures arising from the cytoplasm so from this cytoplasm you can see that hair like structures have come up and these hair like structures are known as dendrites these dendrites help in communication between neurons so that means these dendrites will actually help the different neurons to communicate with each other because communication is a very very important aspect of the nervous tissue because in nervous tissue it is all about understanding a stimulus re reacting to the stimulus and then transferring the stimulus from one point to another point in the body so that communication has to happen from one part of the body to the other so for that communication you need some special structures right so dendrites is one such special structure which help to communicate between neurons you have another structure called axon what are axon? They are single, long, thin structure arising from cytoplasm. So from cytoplasm, you have short hair-like structure called dendrites. And from cytoplasm only, you have a long structure, long, thin structure that is called axon. So this thin hair-like structure again. The only difference is you have many dendrites arising from one cell body and they are all short structures. An axon is a very long structure and there is a single axon arising from a single cell body. So you have a single long thin structure arising from the cytoplasm. So this yellow line is an axon. What is its function? It helps in communication with target organs. So that means dendrites helps in communication between two neurons and axon helps in communicating with different organs. For example, you touched something with your hand. So how did it reach to your brain? So from hand, it has to come to your other organs. It has to reach your brain. So that means to communicate with different organs, axon helps you because they are comparatively longer also. And to communicate between the different neurons inside the nervous tissue, the dendrites help. So the dendrites and the axons are the special things which are present inside 
adipose tissue that actually helps in uh, the functioning of the nervous system. So as I mentioned before also like everything functions as per plan but everything has some speciality because of which they do that function. Right? So the speciality of a nervous tissue is the presence of dendrites and axons in the neuron. Right. So with this, I hope that the structure of a neuron is more or less clear to you. Right. Now, we are not getting into the detail of the neuron structure as of As I mentioned before also that I will teach you the topics as per your level. Now, as you go ahead and uh, you, we will be learning things in more detail. Right. So I hope I have been able to explain you the basic structure of nervous tissue. So when you look at this example of a nervous tissue, you will see that these tissues which I have discussed, they are all connected to each other. For example, let us suppose this boy, he goes and touches an open switchboard. What happens? He gets an electric shock. Now in this entire process, what all happened? It is not only the nervous tissue which played a role. The moment he touched the switchboard, right the nervous tissue reacted because of which he removed his hand he got a jerk so that was because of the nervous tissue now when he moves his hand he is able to move his hand that movement is possible because of muscular tissue right now how is that muscular tissue able to work because the muscles are connected to each other because the muscles are connected to the skin, the muscles are connected to the bone and that connection is done by the connective tissue. At the same time now if you got a shock but still the internal organs which are present inside the body are all safe. It doesn't happen that you get a shock and the person dies. He doesn't die, right? The internal organs are still safe. That's because you have so much of outer covering. Maybe your skin gets a little damaged. You might get a small burn on your skin. So that's because of the presence of the skin, which is again an epithelial tissue. So all the tissues coordinate with each other and help in proper form functioning of our body. So children, did you find the video useful? If yes, do not forget to share it with your friends so that they can also benefit out of this video. And I will meet you all very soon with a new video, with a new topic. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.